And so we see in this scripture that she is about to let them go. And they make this promise. At first it seems a very good promise. This is what you would do if somebody's helping you. They're climbing down out of her window on a robe. The Bible calls it a scarlet robe. Scarlet, red collar. They're, as about, as they're about to get down, they're, they're making her a promise. They say, when we will attack the city, we will save you. If this robe keeps hanging out of the window of your house. And if all of your family is inside of your house. If that doesn't happen, then we're not responsible for your death. That, they go back to Joshua. And they tell Joshua about the story and they get ready to attack the city. Now, this is the f interesting part. They had no weaponry and they had no strategy of destroying the walls. They're making a promise that they cannot keep. It's not going to be them who will destroy the wall. They never touch the wall with their finger. It will be God who's going to use his finger to just push the wall down. But they're making a promise to a woman saying, we got you covered. If I would be her, I would find out how am I going to be rescued. Because your God has a tendency when he uses his fingers, nobody gets in his way. And how in the world will you tell your God to move your finger for the whole wall and miss my apartment? Because the Bible says her house was in the wall, not in the city. So imagine the dilemma. You're making a promise. Yeah, we will attack the city. We'll keep you safe. Oops, I forgot. We don't know how to attack the city. God will do that. And well, we got to let him know your address. That's one of the reasons why I believe prophetically they did not even know what they were doing when they were telling her, leave the scarlet out of the window, not for us, for him. Because it's he who will destroy your city. The number one lesson I want us to learn from today is the blood of Jesus protects us from the wrath of Jehovah. But the real salvation is when you and I are saved by God from God. Now it may sound weird, it may sound strange. Why would God save us from himself? Does God has a bad cop, good cop day kind of deal? Where he cannot figure out what he wants to do, whether he wants to be loving or wants to be holy. But actuality, the Bible says that we are saved from the wrath of God. Many times when we read the Bible, when we read the Old Testament and we see the holiness of God being so exemplified and we come to the New Testament and we feel like that kid in the story who came to his parents and said, Dad, I read the New Testament and I read the Old Testament. Was the New Testament the time that God got saved? Because he was pretty rough in the Old Testament. And he's like, in the New Testament, it's, it's obvious he had a change of heart. God did not get saved in the New Testament. And the cross of Jesus did not change God. Somehow we have this feeling that God in the Old Testament, we see his wrath being, you know, exemplified in many situations. But in the New Testament, we see Jesus playing with babies and children. We're like, well, this is really God. He is really soft and he's really, you know, on, kind of on a loving edge. The Old Testament is God kind of like overboarding on holiness. And the New Testament is God overboarding on love. And the cross somehow made the little shift, metamorphosis. God went from holy to loving. But cross did not change God. Cross revealed God. Because if God would not be holy, there would be no need for the cross. And if God would not be loving, he would never let Jesus hang on it. He would put me and you there. Therefore, cross is the best revelation of who God is. It's not the best indication of who God was. The cross reveals that the high beam speaks of God's unwavering standard and holiness. And the horizontal beam speaks of God's unconditional, stretching, all-inclusive love that says, if all four corners of the earth will come, I will forgive them. Did somebody say amen? amen? When God saved Noah from the flood, I want you to notice that demons were not behind the flood. 
God did not tell Noah, build the boat because Satan is getting pretty ticked off about all of you and he's just going to flood the earth. No, God says, I'm ticked and I'm going to flood the earth. I'm a holy God. And we have problem with God's holiness only when we sin. But when we are sinned against, whoo, I want God to be holy and right now, not tomorrow. Not at the judgment seat of Christ. Not when they die. Right now. All of the holiness. And that's when we sing with angels, holy, holy, holy. And where is your wrath, O God Almighty? But when you are the one committing sin, then the scriptures on holiness, you're like, man, that's kind of rough. That's kind of, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of overboard. Really? Anger, wrath? Man, I'm definitely not going to share that story with my children. But God's love and God's holiness go together. When you are in sin, your problem is not the devil. The devil is your last problem. Your problem is holy God. When you are living away from God, you don't worry about the devil. Worry about your God. The fact that He is holy and whatever you are doing is not taking good with Him. And I know sometimes we have this idea that, well, I will appeal to God's compassion and God will be unholy trying to be loving to me. But if there was ever a time God would be unholy trying to be loving, it would be at the Calvary. When his son, loaded with my sin, looked at his father and said, Dad, why? Have you done this to me? If there was any time during the history, God could bend the rule and God could bend his identity, it would be at that point. If he did then, he will not do it now and he will not do it for me and he will not do it for you.